So guys, welcome to episode nine of Basshole Live. Today we have Darren Wolfson of uh, KSTP. Thanks for coming on today. We really appreciate it. You got it, Peyton, Chris. Good to meet you guys. I will absolutely be a fan of Bassholes now. Yes, <laughs> sir. You get out, whether it's Twitter, Instagram. I think you guys track me down on Instagram. I'm not big into Instagram. I should be, trust me, but I'm 40 now. Cue up to my Gundy soundbite. I'm a man now. I'm 40 years old. <laughs> I just don't have time, you know, with like a nine-year-old and a six-year-old and a high-maintenance wife. Yeah. Right. I don't have time to do Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and everything. I try to do Twitter. So you're, yeah, you're just the Twitter guy, right? Yeah, you guys track me down on Instagram. I'm trying to do more on Instagram, but I can't make any guarantees. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll tweet we'll uh, we'll get you on Twitter then. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So just to start out, like, so what? So what exactly is your job? What do you do like every day? What What is your job? It varies day by day. I mean, like today, for example. I was going to hop on the Timberwolf shoot around access. So at one o'clock this afternoon with the late game tonight in Los Angeles, the Wolves made Ryan Saunders. Today they made players Jordan McLaughlin and Jake Lehman available. But I ended up playing football because I'm working more on night side type shift. So I wasn't technically on the clock until two o'clock. My boys wanted to play football, some snow football. So I ended up playing football. I wasn't <laughs> married to being on that Wolves shoot around Zoom access, but just with my passion for basketball. Oftentimes try to hop on as many Timberwolves Zoom, you know, media availabilities as possible. Definitely. And then I hopped in the office, 2, 2.30. My wife went to her office for a little bit this morning, a little bit into the afternoon. She got home. I hopped in the car, came to the office. Sometimes I anchor. So sometimes I'm on camera. Sometimes I'm on TV on Channel 5. But oftentimes I'm behind the scenes. So Chris Long is in today. I work with Chris Long and Joe Schmidt. Joe Schmidt's using up some vacation before he loses it at the end of the year. So Joe is off this week. Chris is in anchoring for Joe. I'm helping him just put together our six, nine, and 10 o'clock sports cats. So yeah. he got in, you know, 245 or so. We talked. I tracked down some video from MLB Network. I have some friends at MLB Network. So awesome. they sent me some video of, of the new Twins reliever, Robles, the former Angels closer. Yeah, big signing. We, yeah, we rolled on the, on the U.S. Czech Republic World Juniors game. My guy Bobby Brink, I've gotten to know Bobby going back multiple years. Bobby had a couple goals today. The Wilds prospect, Matt Boldy, had a highlight reel goal between the legs. It was it was phenomenal. If you haven't seen it, track it down on, on YouTube or I'm sure it's on any social media outlet. And then we For just sure. we have a couple other things we're doing. We're looking back at the Gopher men's basketball win last night. We Huge used win. some Richard Patino on the 10 o'clock news last night, but we didn't use any Liam Robbins. Robbins was talking. We figured there's still a talker today heading into the Thursday game yep. at Wisconsin. We are using some, some Ryan Saunders. Uh, sound from from this afternoon looking ahead to tonight's game at the Clippers so I just help him put that together I help edit some of the video so that's that's what my day looks like today tomorrow I'll hop on some of the Viking zoom calls uh, Dean Evison the wild head coach is making himself available so I'll hop on that at some point here I'm, I'm supposed to track down Tyler Duffy him and I have been texting the twins reliever Gosh, he seems like a cool dude him. he's a really good dude yeah he's he's a fairly new dad you know, so his time is is pretty precious, but I've been meaning to catch up with him ever since he re-signed. I mean, it was inevitable he was going to re-sign, yep. but I've been meaning to catch up with him since he put pen to paper and re-signed for the 2021 season. So I'll track him down at some point here in the near future. So it's a lot of, you know, I mean, I like doing stuff in person, but right now it's a lot of what we're doing. It's right. It's a lot of Zoom conversations, you know, exactly. Zoom interviews, interviews I can capture just like you guys are recording this. I end up recording interviews and we can use on, on TV these sound bites and I end up putting the full interviews on, on KSTP.com. I'm hopeful that starting on Monday with, with high school winter sports resuming, even though you know the news came down yesterday that athletes need to wear masks at all times. Like I'm curious to see how basketball players are going to be running up and yeah, down the court exactly. while wearing masks. So um, I'm working on being at some sort of practice on Monday, maybe mini haha -ha basketball. It's a good choice. <laughs> yeah, with Chet Holmgren and Prince yeah, Lake right. Bay and all those guys, they have the Gophers offers. And yeah. I saw a mock draft come out where Chet Holmgren is the, is the predicted number one pick in the 2022 Crazy. draft, which makes sense when you're the number one recruit in the class of 2021. But 
I'm still trying to figure that out for next Monday. Like, yeah. because these high schools are still trying to figure out, okay, how many kids can be on the court, for example, for basketball? Like, can we bring in media? Is that okay? Even if they're wearing masks, are they allowed in? So, like, the AD is a good friend of mine over at Minnehaha High Academy, Josh, but he's still trying to figure all this out. So, until he has answers, I unfortunately don't have <laughs> answers. But my hope is I can get to some high school practices starting on Monday. So you could sure. you could say that your uh, your days vary a lot from day to day in the week. Like you, it's always different. Like you're always doing different stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interviews. It's you know just having my finger on the pulse of of every team in town. But yeah, sometimes I'm anchoring. Like last Thursday, last Saturday. Sometimes I'm just producing, which means you know stacking the show yeah. time wise, putting in the graphics, putting in the banners that you see on TV and then finding all the video that we need and oftentimes editing the video. And yeah, I mean, other times it's, it's you know, going out in the field, which is what I really like to do, going to see people face to face and finding stories to tell that way. So yeah, it varies, it varies day by day, but really since the pandemic hit, I mean, going back to March, I mean, I can count on one hand how often I've been able to go out and about and tell a story. Now, thankfully some individuals like Nick Anderson, the, the Rays reliever, he came in the studio a few weeks ago. He went back to Florida. He normally spends his winters here in town. He went back to Florida because everything is open down there. Nothing's open here. So he made the call to go back to Florida, but he came in the studio a few weeks ago. So I went through that interview yesterday and wrote up a story that will air uh, one Sunday in January. So oftentimes what we end up doing is on Sunday nights on Channel 5, we end up getting more time. You know, so some nights we get three minutes for sports or two and a half minutes. On Sunday nights, we get like six or seven minutes to fill. So whether it's January 10th, January 17th, some Sunday in January, I have a longer form Nick Anderson piece that wire. So I went through and, and wrote that up. I reached out to my friends at MLB Network to send me some of their some of their cool video, their back video, the video that doesn't have all the graphics over it. You know, so I mean, that's an example of, of something I did yesterday. Awesome, man. And it's, it's really apparent that you love sports and us, you know, seeing you, it's like a dream job. So, but honestly, how did you get into journalism in general? You know, what, Chris, I, I played sports as long as I could. I went to Henry Sibley high school in Mendota Heights. Mm -hmm. I played as long as I could, but by the time I got to my senior year, I just, I wasn't good enough anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> and so they had a mentorship class at Sibley and I ended up signing up for it with an idea of, of wanting to do something sports-wise. Thankfully, the professor of that class had a student the year before who did a mentorship here at Channel 5 with meteorologist Dave Dahl. Wow. So she had an in here at Channel 5. So she reached out to Dave. The wheels were put into motion with Joe Schmidt, who you know was the sports director way back in 1996. And he's now the sports director now. He left for a little bit. A handful of years ago to, to work in the corporate world, but ended up back here in TV. So she ended up, long story short, setting up a meeting and, and Joe was nice enough to take that meeting. And we sat down one evening and Joe said, yeah, like the kid, he can come in one or two nights a week. So Joe took me under his wing. And then at my mom's urging, she said, you always listen to KFAN radio, KFAN radio. Why don't you reach out to them and see if, if you can help them out in any capacity? And yeah. so I did. And it was a guy by the name of Eric Webster. You guys are too young to remember Webby, but Eric yeah. Webster was an on-air personality at KFAN 96, 97, 98, 1995, and in those years. And I ended up getting a meeting with Webby, and he took me under his wing. And so I ended up, I wasn't getting paid, but it was great experience. So For I ended sure. up helping out KFAN in the afternoons after school a couple days a week, ended up helping out Channel 5 a couple of nights a week. So at least got my foot in the door. You yeah. know, because senior year in high school, I'm like a lot of kids. Like I had, I had like, I had a helping hour with the school nurse, you know, school service it was called or something yeah. like that. I had study hall. I had all this free time my senior year. Right. And so, you know, I was able to do things like that. And, you know, I was able to work a part-time job at a dry cleaner for, for a couple of nights a week to, to earn a little bit of money, gas money. Yep. I had a, I had a beat up, two-tone Dodge Lancer uh, back in the day, my first car, but it got me from point A to point B. Exactly. You know, I was able to buy it for a $1,000. It it held up. And so I was able to drive out to Bloomington. That's where KFAN was in the day. 
here in St. Paul where, where Channel 5 still is. And so senior year in high school, got my foot in the door with K-Fan, you know, Dan Barrero, Chad Hartman, Dan Cole, those guys. That's and, awesome. you know, Eric Webster and, and Sam Sigelman was was a fixture back in the day. He's now a big time attorney. Uh, he's he's far too smart to have stayed in radio for, for two or three <laughs> decades. He's he's moved on to bigger and better. But Sam is still in town and, and still a great guy to this day who who I keep in touch with. And and all those guys at KFAN, I'm still in touch with them, you know, but that's that's where it started. And then my college decision was made that much easier because once I had the the relationships at KFAN and at Channel 5, why the heck would I have gone to Madison for, for college? Or and I looked at, at the <laughs> University of Illinois at one point, but why go to Champaign, Illinois when I had my relationships here in town? So it made my yeah, decision exactly. easy. So I got accepted into the University of Minnesota, said, yeah, you know, like, let me stay here in town. The U of M is right down the street from Channel 5. And so I ended up maintaining my relationships with the fan and in Channel 5. Channel 5 hired me part-time. K-Fan hired me part-time. And I just, you know, kept, you know, hanging on. Next thing you know, K-Fan says, hey, you know, do you want to work with Chad Hartman on air? I'm like, yeah, of <laughs> course. Uh, Channel 5 was always behind the scenes until in 02 when I just decided I needed to live a life like, I was missing out on a lot of college parties, just a lot of good right. times yeah. in college. So I made the decision to go the radio route, said bye to TV in 02. But then in 09, KFAN let me go. They let go 2,000 employees nationwide. Uh, Clear Channel was was the then owners of, of KFAN. So they let go January 20th. I'll never forget the date. January 20th, 2009, they let go 2,000 employees nationwide. I got caught up in that. Ended up working freelance for a bit. Joe Schmidt came back to Channel 5 December of 09. Him and I had always maintained that relationship, Chris. Mm -hmm. So he called me and said, hey, are you interested? They're handing me the keys to the sports department. Do you want to come work for me? Wow. And oh, by the way, in the middle there, when I was on KFAN a lot, uh, Ted Canova was the then news director at Channel 9, Fox 9. And he had always listened to our radio show. For some goofy reason, he took a liking to me. <laughs> Ted called me one day and he said, hey, Doogie, do you have any interest in filling in over here? We need a fill-in sports guy. You know, would you like to come over here, audition? Why don't you read the teleprompter, see if it's something you can do, if it's a fit, you know, if we want you to do it. But I have interest in you doing some, some fill-in anchoring work here at Channel 9. Wow. Went over there, auditioned. It worked out well. So I ended up anchoring a, a handful of nights for, for Channel 9. And so I got on-air experience that way. You know, so when Joe Schmidt called me, he had seen me on Channel 9. We had kept in touch all this time. Heck, I leaned on him for, for advice. I mean, each and every time I told him, hey, I'm going to be on Channel 9 tonight. Like, can you watch? I need some feedback. Tell me sure. what the heck I'm doing wrong, because I know I'm not doing everything right. And so Joe and I had always maintained that sort of relationship. And so it was an easy call for Joe. Joe called me and said, hey, come work for me at Channel 5. Come back to Channel 5, and we'll figure out a role for you. Like, you're not going to be the number two sports guy, but – We'll find some on-air camera opportunities for you, but we want to use you in, in myriad ways. We'll use you behind the scenes. We'll use you on air, but just come work for me and we'll, we'll figure it out. And that was 10 years ago. And I've been here ever since. Definitely, man. That's, that's an awesome trip. And it's just the relationship you've created throughout all those years. is just honestly incredible. All those names. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, honest to God, Chris and Peyton, I mean, that's, that's the thing. I mean, so much of this business, whether it's fortunate or unfortunate is who, you know, yeah. I mean, it's what, you know, don't get me wrong, but, but so often it's, it's who, you know, but then if you're given the opportunity, you have to run with it. Like, you gotta take advantage. I of think it, Joe sure. Buck, like I'll give you guys an example. I think Joe Buck is brilliant at what he does. Mm -hmm. I do. He takes a lot of heat in this town, yeah. but, but <laughs> he does Joe Buck to me is, is, is the gold standard of, of play by play broadcasters. Yeah. Of course, Joe got his foot in the door because of his dad, Jack, right? Yes. But you still need to run with that, right? I mean, Chad Hartman, right? I mean, one of my dear friends. Yeah. Of course, Chad got a break back in the day because of his dad, Sid, the late Sid Hartman. Yeah. But Chad still had to run with it. You know, right. I mean, oftentimes it's it's tougher once you get that opportunity because of your last name. It's not easier, you know, but, but yeah, you do need to know, you know, some people. And, you know, the way this business is going at this point, you know, so many companies are – are cutting left and right. I mean, I'm real curious to see what, what the business looks like in, in a few years. Like I, I honest to God, I wonder on an almost daily basis, 
like what's local TV going to look like? Will the traditional five, six and 10 o'clock news still exist? Yeah. Or will it be just news on demand? Like there's always going to be a thirst for news, but like everybody gets their, their news now on, on their phones anyway. Right. Like, you know, do we need to do a traditional six o'clock news? I'm not exactly. positive we'll need to do that in, who knows, maybe as, as soon as two or three years, but like 10 years from now, I'm not oh. positive we'll need to do that, you know? So, you know, like I know there's always going to be a thirst for, for storytelling and reporting. I'm just curious to see in the next handful of years what exactly it looks like. For sure. I think kind of now we wanted to move into just some Timberwolves topics. Um, you know, so there was a little confusion around the Carl Anthony Towns injury because we saw him, he was listed as questionable the night of the Lakers game. And then it seemed to change once he saw the hand doctor, was it? And now it's week <laughs> to week for the wrist. So is there any, is that, is that still the, still the thing? Is it just going to be week to week from now on? Yeah, it will be week to week. I'll be curious to see if, if they show him on, on the bench tonight, if, if he's got some sort of brace or, or cast on, I mean, I think he is. I mean, I don't think we're going to see Carl sitting there without some sort of protection yeah. on that left wrist. But, yeah, it is truly week to week. The Wolves just have a history, unfortunately, for, for those of us in the media. Although at this point, you know, I ask myself all the time, Journalism 101, why is, why is this person lying to me? <laughs> you know, so like I ask myself that all the time, but the Wolves, unfortunately, for, for fans have a history of of not telling the full extent of the story. Yeah. And it's possible in some instances where, where they didn't fully know, mm -hmm. you know, but I think they'd be better off going the other way saying, yeah, he's he's not playing Sunday in Los Angeles. I mean, they knew long beforehand that, that he was he was going to see a, a, a hand specialist. You know, so why not just be transparent? Because yeah, the league talks, right? Like Carl's got so many different, you know, handlers that that you know whether it's a local reporter like me or or Johnny Krasinski or or Chris Hine from the Star Tribune or Jace Frederick from the Pioneer Press or it's it's Woj from ESPN or Shams from the Athletic. Exactly, yep. Like so many people talk that it was going to get out that he went to go see a hand specialist mm -hmm. that he was going to be out. For, for some sort of extended period that it wasn't going to be a day-to-day -day type thing, that it's more week to week. Now, at this point, I do feel like they're telling us the truth. Yeah. Do I think Carl Anthony Towns is going to be in the lineup early next week? I don't. I mean, I, I don't even know the schedule beyond Friday. I know Friday's a game against the Wizards. Yep. I know they have Denver coming up. I think a couple games against down. Denver. I think a game against Portland mixed in, but but I don't know the the full schedule top of my head. But like if you're asking me one week from today. So we're sitting here on, on what is it? Tuesday, de December 29th. Yeah. Do I think Carl Anthony Towns is going to be back in the lineup early next week? I don't know if they have a game Monday or Tuesday, but if they do, do I think he'll be back in the lineup that soon? No, but do I think he'll be back at like some point in January? I think at this point. Yeah. yeah I mean, unless, you know, unless he has some sort of setback, but yeah, like I think if we talk in three or four weeks, I think it's realistic to think that, that he'll be back at that point. Yeah, it's such a such a tough tough loss, especially after that huge game. Just to just to lose Carl. I like mean, that. just all the emotions too surrounding the family and stuff, and then that happens in the second game. It's just I, I can't imagine what he's just mentally going through right now. Well, one hundred percent. But then, like, just even think about it. Like, John ja Morant is now out three to five weeks. The Golden State Warriors look like garbage. <laughs> I was wrong on them. I'm not trying to 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 overreact to three games. Because I think at some point Oubre and Wiggins will, will make a few more shots, but I he's only Wiggins. he's I don't know about Wiggins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's not forget he was rookie of the year, his first exactly. year here. I mean, I am a bit of a Wiggins apologist, but it's a move the, the trade, the, the Russell trade, even giving up the, the 2021 first. It's it's a move I would have made. I mean, I endorse the move that, that Rosas made. Sure. I'm trying not to overreact to three games, but like it was possible, maybe it still is possible that the Wolves can finish ahead of the Warriors. You know, if Morant is out closer to five weeks, maybe five turns into six. Like, is it realistic the Wolves can finish ahead of Memphis? Yeah. Probably. But now, you know, if Cat's out, say, two weeks, Okogie's out, say, two-ish weeks, like, all of a sudden you're like, crap. You know, there goes the Wolves' chance to, to gain some games on, 
on the Grizzlies and Warriors when looking at a path to, to the top 10? Like, are the Wolves better than San Antonio? Probably not. Maybe, but probably <laughs> not. Yeah. Are they better than Sacramento? They hope so, but Sacramento looks okay here early. Yeah. They're not better than Phoenix. No. Okay, they're better than Oklahoma City. I'll grant you that. Are they better than Houston? I still think Harden goes somewhere at some point. So when they blow up that team, probably. Yeah. But right this second, I don't think they're better than Houston. And I know they're not better. I know they beat Utah, but they're not better than Utah. They're not better than the two L.A. teams. Nope. They're not better than Denver. You know, so you start going up and down the list of, of Western Conference teams. Like, you got to find a path to the top 10, at least to get into that play-in tournament. You know, and I thought that was the path with, with Morant and, mm. and, and, you know, Golden State struggling. But now, I don't know. Like, I don't know. How, how do you win tonight? Maybe you win Friday against Washington, but then those Denver games will right, be yeah. Portland. Like, all of a sudden, you know, after this, after this fun start, this, this 2-0 and start, you know, 2-0 and could easily turn into, you know, 3-6, and 3-7. and seven. Yep. Yeah. You know, and it's only 72 games. It's not 82. It's 72. So all of a sudden, each game matters that much more. But, hey, weren't they – you guys might know better than me, but weren't they 20 or 21 games into last year, like 13 and 8? They had a – I think, didn't they start last season 5-0 and or something like that? And something then, crazy. Something dude. crazy. And they were pretty good after, like, 20 games, and then yeah, they just yeah. fell off yeah the face of the earth i mean they had multiple <laughs> double digit losing streaks which is which is unheard of and ryan is my guy but like i don't know of a coach that could survive two double digit losing streaks that's in one season <laughs> you know but there were there were reasons i mean that's that's a that's a pretty general statement it's a, a factual statement but it's a general statement like yeah. when you break it down you can see why they lost all those games but like so maybe maybe they learned something from from last year all those losses and come March and April, and as Gerson, you know, continues to canvas the, the trade market, you know, looking for a power forward, I mean, maybe you bring in the right guy to, to compliment Cat when Cat's back, and, and maybe you can make a legitimate run to, to the top 10. And that's the goal. Like, you talk to Lehman, you talk to Saunders, you know, those are two guys that, that are pretty firm on the record. Glenn Taylor, I talked to him last week. He's pretty firm on the record, yeah. you know, saying the expectation – is the playoff. So if they don't make the top 10, you know, it's, it's going to be a disappointing season. That's assuming relative health, mm, yeah. relative normalcy. Like obviously if cats out for the season, that changes yeah. expectations. If, if the wolves, you know, have a COVID outbreak, that would change expectations for the season. But you know, if they have relative health you yeah. know, because every team's going to deal with something, you know, so the wolves right now have to deal with cat and Okogi, but Every team is is eventually going to deal with something. So if they don't crack the top ten, gentlemen, to me, this season is is going to be a big disappointment. And yeah, I'd I'd one hundred percent agree on you with that. And you brought up the Harden trade, so I think I I've heard some stuff. I don't know if you've heard anything about it, but is it possible that there could be a three team trade surrounding that Harden situation, where maybe Minnesota is the beneficiary of PJ Tucker, possibly? Yeah, well, I mean, PJ Tucker one hundred percent is is on their radar. I can tell you that, that PJ would have some interest in coming here. Now he wants a contract extension. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I forget what the rules dictate when, when they can negotiate something like that and when the cutoff is, you know, but could there be some sort of, you know, wink, wink, you know, we'll take care of you in the off season. Right. Maybe. I mean, that stuff <laughs> happens a lot. Tampering happens all the time. Pre-free exactly. agency. So stuff like that happens. But PJ would, would have some some interest. I'm led to believe have some interest in in being here. So yeah, could the Wolves somehow get involved? Sure. Heck, you don't think that Gerson would have some interest in Ben Simmons? I mean, what if James goes to Philly? You know, would you want to send a bunch of pieces down to Houston and Ben Simmons could end up here? And I think Ben Simmons would compliment D'Angelo and Cat incredibly well. Perfectly. I like if you could ask, you know. For any player, any star, how about that? Any star uh, to come in here, like, I think he'd be the ideal guy. Right. You know, and him and D'Angelo played together in high school. I forget like, about him. Yeah. Yeah, you you couldn't go wrong having Ben Simmons here. Now, I'm just – I'm spitballing on that. I There there is zero traction. There's zero, yeah. no on, on that front. So, <laughs> make sure that, that if anybody listens to this, that they don't aggregate – 
and it shows up on Hoops Hype and Hoops Rumors and all those sites. <laughs> we, we I'm not reporting that. that the Wolves are <laughs> are involved in in such talks, but I, I think it's I think it's a, a pretty easy talker, right? Like okay. Daryl Morey's in Philly. We're not quite sure that that the pieces Philly has there are going to work. Yeah. If Philly ends up making a move for Harden, Ben Simmons is the logical piece going out. Would Houston, if they move Harden, really want Ben Simmons, or would it make more sense to involve some third team and get you know some future draft picks, get a good young piece? Maybe that would be Anthony Edwards or or somebody else. But wouldn't that make maybe more sense mm-hmm. than bringing in a Ben Simmons? So I'm just saying, if if you want to start connecting some yeah. pretty logical dots, it could make some sense. Now that doesn't mean James is going to Philly, no. you know, like. Neil O'Shea in Portland has a history with James. Maybe Portland decides to get involved yeah. on James, right? I mean, maybe Milwaukee. I mean, James could go any number of places. It's not like he has no trade power. You know, Boston's got so many young assets. and They've got draft picks. Like, what if Boston decides to, to try and, and get involved? So that doesn't mean he's going to Philly. I still think Brooklyn, you know, would, would be an interesting spot with Laverde and Jared Allen, and they have enough young pieces. Dean Witty is, is an expiring. He unfortunately has a partially torn ACL. So mm-hmm. it looks yeah, like he's out for a while, but mm-hmm. his contract at least could have some, some trade value. So I'm just, I, what I'm saying is I'm curious as, as this Harden situation plays out, like to me, it's when not if he gets traded. So like, I'm, I'm highly curious to see where exactly he goes. And yeah. if it happens to be Philly, you know, will there be talks of a third team entering the picture? Yeah, for sure. So um, another interesting question I have is, so we had the, we had the first pick this year in the draft and we took Anthony Edwards, but leading up to the draft, I guess we, like the general public, we didn't know who we were going to take. Did the Timberwolves like know before that they were going to take Anthony Edwards or was that really like a game time decision as it seemed? It was not a game time decision, Peyton. In fact, you know, Glenn Taylor, I, I love the access that Glenn grants me and, and some other reporters. Glenn is great. I mean, Glenn, if anything, says too much. Right. Now, he used to say a lot more than he does now. Some people have gotten <laughs> in his ear saying, you know, Not a, down, down yeah. a little bit. But Glenn told me last week that, that they locked in on Anthony a while ago. Now, a good job by the Wolves to create the smoke screens. Like, right. I, I sincerely thought that they were still making up their mind in those final days and even weeks. But but per Glenn, and trust me, Glenn would know, it's his team. Yeah. <laughs> they locked in on Anthony weeks upon weeks upon weeks prior to the draft. Like, they knew. They so knew. even when they went out and saw LaMelo Ball like a week before yep. the draft, that was more to create the smoke screen. And, okay. you know, I'm sure there's something to be said about due diligence just to make sure you've got all this time, the longest pre-draft process in NBA history. Like, why not? You know, like we can get the FaceTime with them. Why not just take one more meeting? Let's just make sure. Let's triple check yeah. everything. But really, they locked in on Anthony a long time ago. So, like, they weren't even upset that they couldn't get FaceTime with James Wiseman. That was my guy. Now, I get it. Wiseman and Cat would have been yeah. a really weird defensive fit. Yeah. And the Wolves couldn't get James's medical records. So, I get it. Like, Because the number one pick, I mean, that's a $44 million investment. Yes. So I personally, if, if, if I was running the wolves, if I was Glenn Taylor, I would not invest $44 million in a guy whose medical records I don't have access to. I understand that. So it's easy for me to opine and say, yes, James Wiseman was, was my guy. Uh, But I understand why, why they didn't take him, but I don't think they were all that upset. I mean, they tried to get to Miami and visit with him pre-draft, but it never came to fruition. His agent, by the way, also represents Ricky Rubio. So, you know, like Rubio, when when Phoenix made the move for Chris Paul, and his agent was was canvassing the league, trying to find Ricky a home, like the agent was willing to do the Wolves a, a favor in some ways and helped in some ways facilitate that trade. And the agent felt like, hey, you know, you guys did me the favor by, you know, uh, not taking my guy Wiseman. He didn't want Wiseman here, the agent, yep. for obvious reasons. He looks at Wiseman as a five. He yeah. wanted Wiseman in Golden State. He didn't want Wiseman to be the number one pick, you know, and, and the Wolves 
granted that favor, even though the Wolves stylistically weren't going to take Wiseman anyway. Yeah. Not how they want to play with with two bigs. Uh, but I can just tell you, I mean, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. That's an example where, you know, James is, is represented by a big-time agent, big-time agency, and that agency has Ricky Rubio. And and so, you know, that agency helped facilitate Rubio here, here to Minnesota. Yeah, and I know we're running out of time, but just one more question, and I think it was something we were both wondering. But obviously the, the play from the power forwards has been a little bit spotty to start the season with Lehman and Wancho. So is there any possibility that Rondé Hollis Jefferson would come back? You know, when I texted with somebody close to Rondé this morning, there's a better chance he lands elsewhere. Now it's fluid, but there's a better chance he lands elsewhere in the near future okay. than back here. What I'm getting at is now it could change, right? Yeah. The Wolves could get their ass kicked tonight. The power forwards could struggle mightily tonight against the Clippers. And all of a sudden, the Wolves make a phone call tomorrow morning. But yeah. right now, as we sit here at 6 o'clock Central on Tuesday night, the 29th of December, the Wolves have not made a phone call inquiring about how Rondé's doing, you yeah. know, any any sort of inquiries about, hey, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we should bring Rondé back. It just – it. It hasn't happened yet. So I'm not suggesting he's on the cusp of signing with another team right this second, yeah. but there's other teams that have inquired mm -hmm. since the Wolves let him go. So I'm just inclined right now to tell you that there's a better chance he lands elsewhere than back here. But I would have kept him. You yeah. know, I absolutely would have would have kept him. You know, they want the flexibility, but you have some flexibility. I love Jalen Noel. I think Jalen Noel has an NBA future but it's a non-guaranteed contract. It doesn't become guaranteed for a few more weeks, you mm -hmm. know, so you could have made a move on Jalen. I mean, there's just, there's so many guys at his position or multiple positions he can play, but they have so many guys. Like I don't see Jalen's path to playing time. So no. while I like Jalen, I think he'd be better off somewhere else. So I'm, I'm just saying the Wolves could have made a move on, on Jalen Noel if they needed an extra roster spot, but right. they could have just gone with Rondé had the 15 they caught a break with McLaughlin taking yep. the qualifying offer, coming back on a two-way deal, you know. So I would have kept him. Like I, I would start him. I think <laughs> that's what I we would say. Started power forward. Yeah. And and they're going to mix up their starting lineup tonight. I don't have all the particulars, but Jake Lehman is out of the starting lineup. We saw that as of tonight. You know, obviously we know Okogie's out. Yeah. Carl Anthony Towns is out. So I'll be I'll be very curious to see what what the Wolves' starting front court is is tonight how they how they end up you know mixing and, and moving pieces i mean is it russell at the one beasley at the two would you go culver at the three heck would you go small ball i mean could you have anthony edwards guard paul george and go anthony yeah. edwards at the four and maybe you start nas reed at the five uh but yeah it could be it could be interesting to see what they do tonight and moving forward but yeah jake lehman coming off the bench. I also think at some point when Hernan Gomez starts to make more shots and I think he needs to get in better shape. doesn't look to be in great basketball shape to me. No. I do think eventually Hernan Gomez will get a chance to start. doesn't mean he'll be the starter for the full year, but I think at some point we'll see Hernan Gomez in the starting lineup. Yeah. That was just surprising for me because the last 14 games, you know, he was just on, I think he was shooting 42% from the three and then him to just come in these first few games. I don't know if it's from the filming with Adam Sandler or what, but he's just looked off to me. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, he missed the bubble, and yeah. he had a legit excuse. Like, he committed to the movie before <laughs> he knew the dates of the bubble. So I, yeah. I don't fault him. Like, who's going to turn down an opportunity to, to be part of a, a movie, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I understand why he did what he did. But, yeah, I mean, he can talk all he wants about getting workouts in while in Philadelphia filming the movie. But it's not the same. It's just not. Yeah. And it's not like he got legit run, you know, even mm -hmm. three-on-three type run, let alone five-on-five. Five. It just – it didn't happen. So I think he still needs a, a few weeks to, to really get into basketball shape. So I think maybe by mid January, we'll see maybe not the full Juancho Hernan Gomez from those last 15 games of last season, but I think we'll see closer to that than yeah. what we're seeing right now. For sure. Yeah. I mean, we just want to thank you for coming on. Like this was amazing having you on. You're definitely, definitely an awesome guy. Yeah, for sure. Like we uh, convinced my wife of that. Can you convince my kids of that? <laughs> hey, uh, that we'll, would be fantastic. If you guys got anything else, I've got a few minutes if you want to keep going. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I got. So what do you, so we've seen Anthony Edwards, I mean, play in the first few games. What do you, what do you think so far about him? I mean, I'm, I'm very impressed with what I've seen. What do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to be impressed, right? I mean, he's he's a man child, and it even looks like he has. I mean, you guys can tell me if you disagree, but it even looks like to me he's got a little baby fat. That like I think about what his body is going to look like in two or three years. Like I even think about like look at Carl Anthony Towns his rookie year right, compared yeah. to now. Look at Anthony Davis yep. his rookie year compared to now. Look at Dwayne Wade way back when his rookie year compared to you know year five or so in the league. Exactly. Like I think Anthony is going to become even more chiseled. Yeah. And I think the NBA game it's it's what we heard from Tom Crean his college coach and others in the pre-draft process that the NBA game is, is better suited for him than playing in the sec. Like you think about the spacing, there's so much more space for Anthony to operate, to get to the rim. So I think as he keeps going here, I think he's going to get to the free throw line, you know, six, seven, eight times a game, you know? And and so hopefully he's making his free throws at a, you know, 75% clip or so. I think the shot needs work. You know, but but he can get some work in. I mean, look at Jared Culver as an example. Oh. You know, shot like crap for an entire season, reworked his shot in the offseason. Now the shot looks legit. It looks more like just a normal shot. So I think Anthony Edwards needs to refine some of his shooting mechanics. But I think just from a physical standpoint, he looks like a linebacker. I mean, he's right. just – he's he's physically put together, which means he can also defend. Like, uh, offensive guys are not going to just bounce off of him very easily. So – I see the potential. Yeah, I think, I think he's got, I think he's got a very bright future. I think, you know, like the the thought process was entering the draft that this is one of the weaker drafts in right. recent memory. Maybe so, but like I'm convinced. Like Edwards has a bright future. Wiseman, Lamelo, maybe. <laughs> I mean, the passing is off the charts. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's there's certain things to like. Like I understand why. A lot of people like Mike Schmitz and others like feel like his ceiling is is the highest of any prospect. I understand it. You know, I'm friendly with with the Cavs coach JB Bickerstaff. He's a former Gopher. Yep. And so just you know, corresponding with JB a little bit uh, in the preseason, not so much once the regular season starts. I try to leave him alone as much as possible. But I know the Cavs think the world of of Isaac Okoro, and I know like instantly he's going to be an NBA defender. Yep. You know, he's. He's still got to work on some of his offensive skills, but I think Okoro at pick five has a really bright future. I've watched some Sacramento Kings games. Tyrese Halliburton is going to be a good player. I don't know if he's going to be a star. Like we can debate how high his ceiling is, but I think getting him at pick 12, that was a heck of a get. I've seen some Wizards games because I have some friends that work for the Wizards. I think Abdi has got a chance to be pretty damn good. So you start going up and down the list. I mean, there's 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 a bunch of guys that that I think fans should be excited about in this draft class. Yeah, I was myself, honestly, the Patrick Williams at the number four to the Bulls was a little surprising watching the draft. But the first few games I've seen him play, he he looks like the real deal. Like he looks like he can be a real two way player. That's going to be a problem for a lot of teams. I agree. And I mean, heck, look at their starting lineup. I'll steal this from from some Badgers basketball beat reporter, but. You look at the Bulls starting lineup and the Wisconsin Badgers starting lineup age-wise, yep. like the Wisconsin Badgers starting lineup with, with Trice and, and my guy Davison and my guy yep. Reavers. Oh, like, like you look at the Badgers starting lineup compared to the Bulls starting lineup, they're pretty much all the same ages. <laughs> yep. You know, So let's, let's give Billy Donovan and the Bulls some time. I'm with you. I think Patrick Williams is, is like Okoro. He's instantly a, a plus NBA defender. And I think there's enough there to like where, where he's got a chance to do some stuff offensively too. For sure. So if you were to have, I know it's only three games, but one rookie of the year pick, who would you go with? James Wiseman. I just think Golden State gets so much national pub. Now, right now it's for all the wrong reasons, but <laughs> they're committed to be on national TV a bunch. Yep. So I just think a lot of the voters will have their eyeballs on Wiseman more so. And mm. I just think seeing the seven footer make threes, you know, score at, at all three levels you know, alter enough shots on defense, block enough shots on defense. Well, he'll make enough wild plays where you're like, whoa, wow. You know, that guy can can do some special things for being seven feet tall. If he stays healthy, I would bet on James Wiseman being rookie of the year. Okay. And then, yeah, so going away from the Timberwolves, um, what are you thinking about the Minnesota Gophers basketball team? I didn't get a chance to watch the Michigan State game, but I watched the Iowa game and, like, I don't know. I, they're looking pretty good. Yeah, they are. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, every game is, 
is fascinating. I mean, even their games in like, you know, six or seven weeks when, when they'll end up playing Maryland and, you know, even Nebraska, you know, Fred's still got a ways to go down there in Lincoln, but I'm positive at some point Fred will get some more players down there. Oh, for sure. You know, and all of a sudden Northwestern is now ranked like nine big 10 teams are currently ranked. Now Michigan state shouldn't be ranked starting on Monday. So it'll be less than nine on Monday when the new rankings come out. But yeah, I mean, the big 10 is just, it's a constant dog fight, but yeah, when they're moving the ball, like they have, when they're contesting shots, the way they have, when they have such an elite uh, shot creator and shot maker and Marcus Carr, he's a legit NBA prospect. Now I'm not suggesting he's a first round pick, no, but you gotta be flying. Marcus Carr is, is a legit NBA prospect. Yeah. And he might have to play in the G League for a year or two, but like Marcus Carr is good enough to eventually play in the NBA. No, he's like a his real shot good. making is is off the charts. It is amazing to me that preseason, the, the preseason Bob Cousy point guard of the year watch list, it listed 20 point guards. Marcus Carr wasn't on that list. Like the biggest travesty in college basketball that, that I can think of. Like, and I love McKinley Wright, Champlain Park kid. Yep. And he should be top 20, but like I'd put Marcus Carr above McKinley Wright. I'd put Marcus above a lot of point guards, not Jalen Suggs, but I'd put him above a lot of point guards. You know, like the Virginia point guard whose name is escaping me, but he's on there because he happened to start when they won the national championship two years ago when he was a sophomore. Now he's a senior. That's just because they won the national championship. Like if you look at the two players, and that not that he's a bad player, but Marcus Carr is a better player. Yeah. Than the Virginia point guard. So that to me is, is mind blowing, but yeah, I think Booth Gotch is, is going to make more shots. He's not shooting the ball real well right now. Gabe Kausher, I do worry about. Yeah. He told me and a few other reporters a couple of weeks ago that it's mental, that mechanically his shot is fine, that he feels like it's mental. Uh, well, I mean, they do have a, a sports psychologist on staff over there. I hope, I don't know, but I hope that Gabe has, has talked to that sports psychologist, but it worries me with, with mental hurdles. Like I'd feel better if it was a mechanical issue, right. <laughs> fix the mechanical issue. Boom. You go back to being the shooter you were two years ago, but we're now looking at like a 35 game sample size going back pretty much all last year where, where Gabe has struggled to shoot, but his defense his on ball defense is the best on the team. So Gabe has value, oh, yeah. but it just would be nice if Gabe started to make some more shots. But I do think Booth Gotch will make more shots. I know NBA scouts that, that like Liam Robbins, so right. I think he's got a chance to play in the NBA. Not maybe next year, maybe in two years, but but Liam Robbins is that good. Mm -hmm. Brandon Johnson all of a sudden is oh my, I was just all these three pointers. I, I didn't see that coming. I was, but he is. So if they want to keep shooting like that, they'll be in good shape. But like I wouldn't be upset just because I know how much of a of a grind the Big Ten is. Like if they lose Thursday at Wisconsin, don't jump off the bandwagon. No. Like if they lose. They're still a good team. They really are. And my hope is they're good enough to maybe be as high as like a four or five seed in the NCAA tournament. For sure. Yeah, with Brandon Johnson, when he was making all those threes against Iowa, I was like, I can't even imagine how loud the barn would be right now if it had full capacity. Like, yeah, that's just crazy to me. Yes, although you just don't know, like, Maybe he doesn't make all those shots <laughs> with, with the crowd right on top of him, right? Maybe, yeah, that could yeah, it could play a factor. In Maybe it. the game goes different. Like it's yeah. so hard to quantify. I don't know, but clearly home court advantage really isn't a thing. No. I mean, like the Gophers are going to to Madison on Thursday. The only weird thing about going to Madison on Thursday will be that Wisconsin uses this unique basketball. So the Gophers have a Nike contract, so they use a Nike ball. Yep. You guys can Google it, but. The Wisconsin Badgers use this unique basketball. It weighs a little bit less. I mean, it's really? it's not that much different than the Nike basketball, huh. but it's a different basketball. That's the only weird thing about playing at Wisconsin. Then I guess, you know, the Wisconsin players, I guess, know the, the Cole Center rims right. that much yeah. better. But a, a lot of these gophers, or some of them, at least Kausher, Carr, you know, some of these guys, Eric Curry, have played at the Cole Center before. They've shot around on on those yeah. hoops. I mean, with nobody in the stands, like I just I don't think home court advantage is is really a thing, you know. But hey, if if it helps the Gophers who have struggled on the road in the Richard Pitino era with with crowds, 
Uh, and we don't know how much the crowds impacted a lot of those games, but there were crowds, and the yeah. Gophers have lost a lot of road games in Patino's eight years. Uh, this might be a good thing that there are no fans in the stands. Yeah, to, to break it to you, Chris actually goes to Madison, so I am a big Badger guy, but... Which is fine. Hey, yeah. Chris, I freaking love Madison. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> a great Street Brats. Uh, what's the burger place? It's like three Ds. Dottie Dotties. Dottie something, Dumplings. something. Yep. Freaking love that place. Oh, I yeah. love Madison. Like, I miss going to Madison. Yep, for sure. I love it there. I've had a lot of heartbreak there. I was in the stands in November of 2014. And the Gopher football team was up two touchdowns. Yep, yep. Second half, if they had won that game, they would have won the Big Ten West. They would have played in the Big Ten championship game. Melvin Gordon ended up going off in the second half. But I was there for that game. I took my my older son to, to the Wisconsin-Michigan game mm -hmm. last two Septembers ago when Jonathan Taylor just ran all over the Wolverines. Yep. Uh, I, I try to get to a Badger football game every year. Obviously, it didn't happen – this year, but going back like six or seven years, uh, I've made it to a football game in Madison just about every year. I, I love awesome. Madison. Yeah, for sure. And I think we have just one more question, but I was wondering, I'm personally not a Vikings fan. I, I have some family ties in Chicago. That's the only Chicago team I picked up. So I'm a Bears fan, but I was wondering from some of the Vikings fans, is Mike Zimmer on the hot seat at the moment? Well, he signed a multi-year contract extension in the summer. Mm -hmm. I'm positive when I say multi-year that there are at least two years remaining on that deal. Could potentially be three. It could be some sort of mutual option, team option. But put it this way, by my calculations, it's a rough estimate, but, but I think I, I have it in the ballpark that he's got at least $16 million remaining on his contract. So if you were Ziggy Wilf, if you were the Wilf family, are you willing to pay Zimmer $16 million to walk away, then pay, you name the coach, Urban Meyer? Are you willing to pay Urban Meyer 8 to $9 million a year to come in here on a five-year deal? So let's say to get Urban Meyer, heck, to get Urban Meyer, you'd probably have to go five years, $50 million. So let's go a different coach. Let's go... Who's that Northwestern guy? Isn't he supposed to? Pat Fitzgerald, sure. Or Lincoln Riley. Yep. Or whoever. You name the, the popular coordinator. Eric Bieniemy. okay? Yep. Even Eric Bieniemy. I don't think Eric Bieniemy's agent is taking a deal that would pay him way less than what Mike Zimmer was making. So those agents know I may not have the exact amount of what Mike Zimmer makes on a per year basis, but I can promise you they the know. agents have a really good idea. Yeah. So if you're representing Eric Bieniemy. Would you take a five-year, $25 million deal when you know that Zimmer was making close to $8 million? Maybe you're willing to take a little bit less if you're a first-time head coach. Yeah. Because if you're the enemy, even if you might have options, you have to be realistic, right? First-time head coach. Mike Zimmer's been doing it for seven years. I need to take less than what he was making, but I don't think you're taking way less. But let's say let's say you get the enemy for five years between 25 and $30 million. But I'm just saying, start doing the math on that. If you're the Wilfs, are you willing to pay a total of $45 million guaranteed to make a coaching change? No, he's not that bad. I don't think that that's happening during the pandemic, yeah. right? Like we can debate how much money they've lost out on because just to say they lost money, I think is incorrect because they're still making all the national TV money. Exactly. So it's not like the Wilfs are, are, you know, living check, check to check, right? Like <laughs> sure. They lost out on some revenue streams this year but they still brought in enough money for sure. But that's not the way they look at it. They look at it and say, okay, we lost out on ticket revenue. We lost out on, on parking revenue. We lost out on, on this revenue stream, that revenue stream with, with no fans allowed. So like, why are we going to spend all this money then after the season? I mean, I think there was also some sort of presumption that this would be a little bit of a rebuild with all those draft picks. Yeah. And I don't know if the expectation was playoffs or bust. I think they would have happily taken a playoff appearance. I think there's probably some disappointment that the defense was this bad, especially yeah. late in the year, that there weren't signs late in the year of the defense getting better. So I'm sure there's disappointment. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think the Wilfs were expecting the playoffs like hardcore this year. Mm -hmm. And without this playoff berth, you know, heads, heads are going to roll. Now, could we see some changes? 
sure, like the special teams coordinator is probably in trouble, right? Like logically speaking, He's got so it. many special teams issues this year. That makes sense. I'm curious if Gary Kubiak still wants to coach. If he wants to, the Vikings would love to have him back. But he's up there in age. Now his son is the quarterback's coach, so he loves being around his son. Yep. So I think Gary Kubiak will be back. But that's something I'm curious on. You know, certainly Maloof. But I'm not, I'm not digging deep. I mean, it's on my radar, you know, just with Black Monday, you know, forthcoming on Monday. Yep. You know, we probably will see at least one, if not multiple. I mean, a lot of firings now happen – in season, but like I'm sure Adam Gaze is going to lose his job on Monday. So we'll see some head coach or or head coaches lose their jobs on Monday. But I'm just not I'm not all aboard, you know, digging on, you know, I think Mike Zimmer is about to lose his job. If if I had to bet, I, I do think, you know, as long as his health is okay, then Mike is back as head coach next year. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. All right. So Again, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. We, re we really appreciate it. Yeah, this is awesome. You got it, Bassholes. Happy New Year. Peyton and Chris, good to connect with you and, and track me down. Happy to do this another time. Oh, for sure, sure yeah. Be honored to have you back. You All right, got it. thank you.